Welcome to Philosophical Conversations, I'm Sarah Jane Leslie. Anyone who has ever been in love knows how the world around them can seem to be transformed. Colors are brighter and sounds are sweeter. Your loved one appears and is suffused by a rosy glow, a halo of light. Simple acts and simple places take on a secret, sacred aspect. Of course, the objective world has not changed. It's rather our perception of it that has been altered. In this way, we might suppose that love leads us to project certain qualities onto reality's canvas. Sometimes, of course, we may even project onto the very object of our love. As Marcel Proust writes in his masterpiece, A la recherche du temps perdu, when we are in love with a woman, we simply project onto her a state of our own soul. It is only a clumsy and erroneous form of perception which places everything in the object when really everything is in the mind. Love places in a person who is loved what exists only in the person who loves. That is to say, in our loved one, we may perhaps only see ourselves reflected back. A yet more sinister aspect of this human capacity for projection is illustrated by the words of Vladimir Nabokov's Humbert Humbert, who, observing pubescent children, remarks, You have to be an artist and a madman, a creature of infinite melancholy with a bubble of hot poison in your loins and a super voluptuous flame permanently aglow in your subtle spine, in order to discern at once, by ineffable signs, the slightly feline outline of a cheekbone, the slenderness of a downy limb, and other indices which despair and shame and tears of tenderness forbid me to tabulate, the little deadly demon among the wholesome children. She stands unrecognized by them and unconscious of her fantastic power. Humbert Humbert is here projecting his own sexual desire onto a child, seeing in her a seductress, a little deadly demon ready to ensnare him. Similar sentiments are echoed by the rapist. She was asking for it. She wanted it all along. The rapist projects his own desires onto the victim, justifying the crime and perhaps even absolving himself of responsibility. As Humbert later remarks after he rapes 12-year-old Lolita, it was she who seduced me. What, though, is the precise nature of this human capacity for projection? How might we recognize its workings and guard against its worst effects? To what extent is society around us shaped by its elusive influence? Joining us today is Dr. Ray Langton, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge and Professorial Fellow of Newnham College. Professor Langton, thank you so much for joining us. So what are some varieties of projection that we might want to distinguish? When I think of projection, I find it hard to ignore what David Hume said when he talked about how we gild and stain the world with the colors of sentiment. And Hume was absolutely terrific on um, describing how our desires and our emotions and our beliefs, so to speak, print things on the world that then seem to be out there independent of our own minds. And this has its fantastic side and it has its sinister side. So that's one sort of perception, but there are other sorts as well. And I think Hume talked about some of them too. Yeah, so what would some others be? Well, I remember when Hume is discussing the immortality of the soul, uh, he comments sarcastically on the fact that any belief that is so um, 
ardently wished for um, is suspect on those very grounds. Our desires and our wishes shape um, what we see and what, we're, and what evidence that we are sensitive to. So wishful thinking is another sort of projection that's there in Hume, um, which has its good side and its bad side. You know, its, its good side was uh, described by William James. So James, in his marvelous essay, The Will to Believe, um, talks about how um, wishful thinking, he doesn't call it that, faith is what he calls it, <laughs> faith can get you what you would never have been able to get otherwise. It can help you leap across a mountain chasm. You want to get across, you want to believe you can get across, believing you get across is going to enable you to get across, so wishful thinking brings with it a power to enable you to get across, which then makes the wishful thought true. Mm -hmm. So James was one of those philosophers who really described the way that wishful thinking can be self-fulfilling. That has its good side and he was a champion of its good side. He thought that all of our social relationships and even our religious beliefs are all going to go better if only we adopt a principle of wishful thinking, only he called it faith. Mm. Um, it's got its bad side as well though, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's this, what we might call phenomenological gilding mm -hmm. where um, say our joy reactions or our disgust reactions, yeah. we, we project, as it were, yeah. these qualities onto the world, but then seem to perceive the world as objectively, in fact, having these qualities, yeah. confirming, um, confirming, as it were, our perceptions of it. Yeah. Then another variety might be what you're discussing as wishful thinking, or what we might even call faith under some circumstances, uh, belief that um, the belief that emerges out of a desire to be able to do something, the effect of, say, that you're able to do that thing. Or more generally, just wanting a particular state of affairs yeah. to obtain, you come to believe that that particular state of affairs is obtained. And as you're pointing out, that can actually, in some cases, bring about that state of affairs. Exactly. So what William James was especially interested in was the idea of, basically, a kind of wishful thinking that was self-fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Faith, in a fact, helps create the fact, as mm -hmm. he put it. Um, and faith in the fact, helping create the fact. The good side of that, for James, was in our friendships and love affairs, when we you know, ardently believe, she will love me. Mm -hmm. And that belief, he thinks, can help actually create the hoped for reality. Of course, that's a rather optimistic take on it. And the sinister side is when you what, inflict your wishes uh, on somebody else and believe, guided by wishful thinking, that um, they are exactly as you would wish them to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is where the good thing that James was talking about mm -hmm. looks pretty similar to the bad thing that feminists talk about when they talk about a certain sort of objectification where um, um, desiring the world to be a certain way shapes that way. It's a kind of mm -hmm. um, sort of, you know, wishful imperialism which in a circumstance where other people need to shape themselves to your wishes hmm. shapes hmm. that social world. So what is this notion of objectification here? How should we understand that? Probably the single most important idea about objectification is the idea that there is something wrong with treating a person as a thing hmm. and the philosopher who put that idea on the moral map more eloquently than any other was Immanuel Kant. Kant says that we must treat humanity, whether in ourselves or in 
another person always as an end and never as a means only. So he put at the foundation of his moral philosophy the idea that it is wrong to treat other people as tools or instruments. And that was actually a fairly new thing to say. Um, there were many ideas in moral philosophy before that, including ideas about treating people as instruments. So Aristotle had said that a slave is a human tool, I believe. Um, but what's wrong with that? He didn't notice anything wrong with that. Whereas for Kant, the wrongness of treating human beings as mere tools or instruments, that was at the heart of his philosophy and that's captured in the principle of humanity. And I think not coincidentally, that is also that has also been a really important theme in contemporary feminist work that's informed by moral philosophy. So, for instance, Martha Nussbaum has a wonderful paper whose title is just Objectification. Mm -hmm. And she describes a number of different ways in which one might treat a person as a thing. And at the core of her cluster concept of objectification are the Kantian ideas of treating a person as a tool or instrument and denying their autonomy. One thing though that's interested me is how that idea of objectification that has Kantian roots, treating someone as a thing, as a tool, as a mere means to your end, um, how that connects up with the idea we were just talking about mm -hmm. from I think of it as having sort of Humean roots, the, the idea of projection. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but actually Hume's idea of projection itself has been called objectification. Professor Langton is noting here that there are two distinct notions of objectification in play, one associated with the philosopher Immanuel Kant, the other with David Hume. The Kantian idea is that, in morally objectionable circumstances, we may perceive and treat others as mere objects, as means to our ends, rather than as ends in themselves. The Humean idea, in contrast, is that we mistake our own subjective reactions for objective features of reality around us, rather than recognizing they are merely features of our own personal experience. In this way, we project our own inner states onto the world around us. What happens when these two forms of objectification collide? Suppose that one person views another as an object, as thing-like, as valuable only, say, for their physical appearance and the pleasure that appearance can bring. Given our inclination to project, one may not recognize that this is only a subjective perception, but rather take it to be revelatory of objective reality, that this other truly is thing-like, an object to be enjoyed. We project our desires and beliefs and values on the world in such a way that those desires and beliefs and values seem to be vindicated by what we see. That's mm -hmm. part of the projection. But the result of that sort of projection is that people end up being treated as more thing-like mm -hmm. than they otherwise would be. In other words, objectification in this epistemological sense of projection can feed into objectification in this moral sense treating as a mere means, treating as a tool, treating as mm -hmm. having instrumental value. So in the work of many feminists, including McKinnon, there has been this interplay between the epistemological idea that you know, the powerful see the world the way they want it to be, and that then shapes what they see and what they see is people, women, who then become more thing-like because that is what they're wanted to be. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's how the epistemology and the ethical, uh -huh. the epistemological and the ethical dimensions sort of come together. One 
example that your discussion illuminates is perhaps uh, a certain tendency when if men find women particularly sexually desirable, there can be a uh, relocating of the locus of responsibility for, say, any actions that occur after that from the man onto the woman. So we see this to some extent in our society if people speak about, say, a, a rape victim who wore a short skirt who was quote unquote asking for it, but maybe even more extremely in other cultures where women are expected to cover up entirely on the grounds that if they display themselves, um, they're so inherently sexy that the men can't be expected to control themselves in response I, to that. I think I'm so glad that you said that because what, that, what you just said, well, first of all, is absolutely right, but also um, brings out how that um, apparent justification of, one's, of, of what one sees and the apparent... Um, attribution of something intrinsic to what one sees, of something that's really in yourself, mm -hmm. um, is there, it's talked about in philosophy in many other places. It's talked about when we're doing meta-ethics, when we're, when we're talking about whether value is just some sort of projection, which it isn't, um, whether we're talking about whether color is just a subjective projection on the world, which it probably isn't, but I'm not going to go there. Um, but then in a social context, you're absolutely right that um, um, projecting onto what you see when what you see is a woman and um, the and making that somehow intrinsic to what you see thereby ascribes responsibility mm -hmm. to um, the person that you're seeing for whatever it is you're feeling mm -hmm. when really um, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Um, a person who attended a Catholic school told me an anecdote the other day where the girls had to sit in the rear of the classroom because they had to be located where the boys couldn't see them lest they distract the boys. So the emphasis was not on teaching the boys self-control but the emphasis was on relegating the girls to the rear end of the classroom so that they wouldn't be the causes right. of this kind of distraction. Well, that doesn't sound like it's showing much respect either to the boys or to the girls. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, but now, of course, in those uh, sorts of examples, these arguably aren't clearly cases where the world needs to conform. It, it needn't be that this property of being so incredibly sexually desirable is genuinely located in the woman, that's still maybe a perceptual, merely projected property. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what, what's an example of a case where the world actually comes to conform in this sort of way to the projectors? Um, right, okay, outlook? good. So we've been talking um, just now about how it's a kind of illusion. It's an illusory projection, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and it's not true that we should be holding, in this case, the woman responsible for um, whatever it is the man is feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, I mean, one of the most interesting things about projection is that it seems to supply evidence at a number of different levels. Once, once the whole thing gets going, um, mechanisms of projection serve to shore up hierarchical and objectifying social systems in ways that don't need any ill will from anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as if anyone's trying to perpetuate it or build it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's just because, um, especially in situations of inequality, um, when you are in a position of relative powerlessness, you are going to shape yourself to what is expected of you, what is wanted of you, um, what you see as your identity. And mm -hmm. your identity is, in the sorts of situations we're thinking of, your identity as a woman. You are, you are going to be invested in whatever uh, is wanted of you. And that's going to mean, first of all, that you're going to supply the appearance that's wanted, even if you don't really feel it. Mm -hmm. And then more deeply, 
you're going to come to feel it yourself. An interesting footnote to all this is that there's just a wealth of, of empirical evidence across all sorts of contexts that just shows how incredibly good we are at living up to other people's expectations or even living down to them, as the case may be. Good. That's, I'm glad. I should ask you more about them. I, but that same, I'm, I'm sure that's right. And this is the sort of thing that philosophers of social science, like hacking, have talked about under the heading of social looping effects, where um, thinking of things in a certain way, classifying them a certain way, has a self-fulfilling aspect where people then come to conform that way. And in fact, Beauvoir talks about it in the opening chapters of The Second Sex. She talks about how uh, in America, uh, as I think I'm sort of quoting, they treat the Negro as a shoe shine boy and then are surprised he can do nothing more than shine shoes. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, it's a very um, old idea, but it still needs attention paid to it. Absolutely. So do you think there's any other varieties of projection that we encounter? Well, when I was thinking about this, I'm thinking about ideas that one finds in Hume, who I think mm -hmm. was one of the most interesting philosophers writing about psychological mechanisms of projection. He also talked about how he had a metaphor for how we're like uh, sort of violin strings that when one vibrates in a certain note, the others do too. And, and how, not just that, but how uh, so we are, we are sort of disposed to a certain kind of sympathy, but also we're disposed to a certain kind of empathy where we can get carried away and go too far. So he talked, when he was talking about the origins of religion, about how we see the gods up there in the clouds. We, um, th we think they're like us. Now this kind of projection You could call it sort of pseudo-empathy. It's, it's treating the other as like yourself. And I'm just calling it pseudo because you're not bothering to find out whether they really are like yourself. Mm -hmm. The projection of pseudo-empathy, I'm sure, mm -hmm. has a role to play in good things and bad. Um, the bad things would be where we leap to the conclusion that uh, what somebody else wants, uh, for instance, in sexual contexts, is exactly the sort of thing that we would want. Um, and that's especially going to be assisted by, um, I guess, pornographic uh, myths mm -hmm. that might be there in the background. So that's a different theme. It connects with a different theme that we've talked about. Right. So in our uh, previous segment we spoke about different effects that mm -hmm. at least certain kinds of pornography might have on society and one aspect of this one mechanism whereby it might operate would be to um, perhaps even give confirmation to people's pseudo uh, empathic projections um, if uh, say uh, an individual wants to treat a woman in a certain way and pornography depicts her as wanting to be treated in that way then that might be confirmation to that individual that women in general say want to be treated in this way yes. even if that may well not be that's right. the case. That's right, that's the thought. So you have two triggers to the conclusion she wants what I want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, both of them assisted maybe by pornography. One of them, straightforward wishful thinking, wouldn't it be nice if she wanted what I want? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other, pseudo empathy, just leaping to the conclusion. And of course, assisted by, you know, ignorance, alcohol, whatever. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything else that makes us not think very clearly at certain times. But in any case, so, so yes, um, th and that's not to say it hasn't got it's good side. In all of these we have, you know, phenomenological gilding and wishful thinking and uh, empathy are projective mechanisms which, you know, I can, I, I 
partly by William James's story about how good they can be, mm-hmm. I think he wasn't sufficiently alert to how bad they can be as well. There is a deep vein within us which leads us to project ourselves and our desires onto others and then take that projection to the underlying truth. If certain conditions are met, others may even take it upon themselves to conform to that projection. In this way, our projections can shape the very reality around us. In contexts where groups have asymmetrical power and status, this phenomenon can have profound and far-reaching consequences. Professor Langton, it's been a joy having you with us on Philosophical Conversations. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. Great interview. Advice.